Hello, Internet. Gino, that Pinguino Grieco here again with another episode of Deep Listens. This time we're going to be discussing Mass Effect. This is our spoiler-free half of our podcast. I am joined, as always, by Billy. I like Blue Girls Rother. I mean, Liara was the only choice for who I was going to romanticize in this game. Um, but hello, everyone. Welcome to Deep Listens. My name is Billy Rother, a.k.a. Rothgar. I'm happy to be talking about Mass Effect today. I am also joined by soon-to-be PhD candidate Peter Flashlight Face Busby. Just a couple more months, fingers crossed. Let's get it done. Fun fact for this week's edition: You guys ever read the book Ringworld? Nope. No. Science fiction classic. But did you know that more energy from the sun hits the Earth every hour than we use in a year? So if we could collect all the solar energy that hits the Earth in an hour, we'd have energy for a year. That's wild. Insanity. Right? Get, get on better solar panels. Right. Everything. So Ring World's about a Dyson sphere, kind of. That's where you'd surround the whole sun and collect all its energy. Ah. I thought You're it was quite... a prequel to Halo. No. What? <laughs> and Flashlight Face, just in case you didn't know it, I think they someone calls the Geth that. Like three or Yes, five, they do. That is a derogatory, a derogatory term for the Geth <laughs> which I do not <laughs> I'm sorry to remind you of, of the deep dark Of the times. social justice yes. perpetrated against the Geth. And I'm also joined this time by our another special guest, Devin. Welcome to the fold, D. Francesco. I am so excited to be here. I've been a longtime listener, and I'm finally a contributor. So, backstory to this episode. We <clears throat> recorded a Mass Effect podcast, but like every good podcast, like every professional well-constructed, well-thought-out podcast, we lost the episode entirely. Yes, we did. Um, so now we're re-recording. A week later... Bad things happened. And it's going to be better than ever. We've been oh, ruminating on it. It disappeared. It's fine. It we're was, not pointing any fingers. chaos. Billy. We're not pointing any fingers. Gino, dropping it the first time. We're not pointing any fingers. Fingers. I didn't. I know that. It's not Pete's fault. All I can say is not Pete fault. lost no digital content. That's true. Right. Devin lost no digital content. That's about That's all we right. can say. So other than that, who's to say who's to blame? I mean, you know, there's only two options, and it's, uh, you know, I think you're in the clear, Gino. You know, you know just, I think I'm in the clear, too. You know? I'm going to say this. In a court of law, if there's reasonable doubt, you can't convict anyone. <laughs> so we're both That's innocent. True. Double jeopardy? Yeah. Maybe? No, Don't no. worry about it. I don't know a lot so, about the law. This episode, we're going to be talking about mostly the mechanics of Mass Effect and some of the underlying systems in the game. So, Billy, you love to describe in painstaking things. detail uh, mechanical things. Which would you like to dive into first? The combat system, the different classes? I think the classes are a good place to start. What do you think? Yeah, I think we have to do classes just because it sets the context for so much of what we're talking about anyway. So and We all have so much class. <clears throat> right. Right. It's a classic um, podcast. <clears throat> starting, class. yeah. Starting a new game of Mass Effect, you are uh, posed with a couple of options. One of them is, you know, creating the aesthetic look of your of your character, um, who you will call Commander Shepard. You can be male or female. You can choose their physical appearance and all that good stuff. But you also pick a couple of background pieces. For example, you can choose to be like an Earth-born person, a colonist-born person, or a spacey. Is that what they call um, them? The, the the spacers I think is the colonist. There is like some sort of alliance military. Like you're a military family. No, there's family. Earthborn colonist and spacer. One of them so is an alliance military family. The same thing, and then there's yeah, the, and it's spacey is the alliance military family. Anyway, then you can also be like a war hero, a soul survivor, or one of the one. I'm forgetting. The third one. Yeah, uh, basically, was that, it yeah. ruthless? Yeah, was... yeah. And and those things play a little bit into the story. Not so much. There's only at like key turning points a character will recognize that, hey, you're that person from this war hero scenario, or you're that asshole who sacrificed your entire crew to do whatever, and you know, maybe you have to do a little bit more to build their trust or something. <laughs> what what we yeah, what we really get into is these is these classes that you choose for Commander Shepard. You have six options at the start of the game, and it governs a large portion of the combat and you know stuff like that that goes on in the game. So um there are three types. There's basically a like physical combat type. There's a psychic 
sort of spell casting type and a technology like gadget support type. The combinations of these three is like there's three three classes that are maximum of each of those. And then for each two when combinations, you, when there's you a new say class. physical combat. You mean just shooting fools? Yeah, like just guns, just gun combat. Guns, right? armor, and then a couple other like side things. You got right. Gun you have kata. a couple of gun abilities. Yeah. Oh, gun kata. So the names of these classes is soldier is the all guns all day. Um, engineer is the all tech all day. Uh, what's the adept. Adept. adept? Adept is the all psychic all day. Yeah. Biotic. The yeah, force. but they're called biotics, the but force. it's basically the force from Star Wars. Um. Then you have Sentinel is guns and biotics, which is the psychic stuff. You have Vanguard. Wait a second. Did I get that right? Vanguard yeah, is... I think you messed it up. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Vanguard is guns and biotics. Sentinel yeah. is biotic and tech. Yep. And Infiltrator is guns and tech. Yes. Whew, got it. You did. So hey. these three classes, sorry, these six, these six classes govern your combat style. Then... Your party members, of which you can choose two at any time, also range across all six classes. So you have you in one class, and you have all six classes to choose two of to be in your party with you. Holy shit, that was a long description, but that's basically there are, there are, how it There goes. are also four different weapon types. Yeah. Pistols. So, you got your small guns, you got your assault rifles, you got shotguns, and you got sniper rifles. And those, each of those gun types, soldiers can use all of them, and then every other class basically is able to train in one additional one or, and one pistol. or two of them. Pistols yeah. the default. The important thing to mention here is when you can use any gun in Mass Effect, right. you are capable of <laughs> equipping any gun. If you equip a gun you have no training in, just bullets go everywhere. They just <laughs> your reticle says you're aiming at a thing. But the the shot could go directly into the ground. It can go wildly in the air. You basically it's you un- also you, can't it's, use it's the like the crosshair. Yes, like you can't like zoom in. You can't really aim. It's don't don't use the guns you're not trained in. So you if you're shotgun. equipping a sniper rifle, you're only no scoping. <laughs> <laughs> not only are you only no scoping, but when you're no scoping, sometimes the bullet decides to go behind you and do other sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> Which, like, maybe technically that means you're even better trained with the gun. <laughs> you can just manipulate the bullets you get like gun that. tricks. Yes. But I tried it. Like, I got a great sniper rifle the first time I played, and I think I was playing as an adept or something. And I'm like, oh, great, I've got this sniper rifle. I can equip it. Let's see what happens. And it's just shot directly into the ground. Gun overheats immediately. I'm like, oh, no. That's how Explosed they fixed it. Explosion in your hands. Now you have no fingers anymore. Yes, exactly. That's how they solve for it. So, which of the classes did you guys pick when you each played through? Billy. I chose Infiltrator. I liked the idea of using tech, and I also like using sniper rifles. I went soldier, because why would I mess around with dumb, stupid powers when I can just shoot people? Guns are the ultimate power. Right, guns are the perfect solution. If the history of Western society has taught us anything, it is that guns is the ultimate power. <clears throat> Any problem can be solved by throwing more guns at it. Devin? So I played through this game twice. I played through it once before, but prior to this podcast, I just played as soldier. And then I realized the, the horrible mistake that I made the, the first time around. And then I played again for the podcast specifically and played, played Vanguard, which is the biotic shooting. I, I still want a little bit of shooting possibilities but i just really wanted to have the force too yes having the force is very key i for this podcast i played through as a vanguard i have played this game as every class except i don't think i've played engineer and i don't think i've ever played sentinel actually i also haven't played soldier because i like the powers too much and sentinel just you get powers in tech and and uh biotics but you get the worst powers in each of those trees. So I just never went down that route. And then Engineer, just again, tech was not so good that I would want to give away biotics. And the guns you get to use as, a, as an engineer aren't very good. Also worth mentioning, once you beat this game once, you can pick an additional ability from any of the classes you've beaten the game with 
to be your extra special bonus ability. So when I was playing as a Vanguard, I got to have Singularity also, which is absurd. Did the sound just did the sound just goof up on anybody else? Yeah, me too. I I don't know. I'll say that again. I had Singularity. It was really good. As a Vanguard, you shouldn't have Singularity. You shouldn't be able to have a shotgun and a pistol and also make everyone spin in the air. All crazy. Do those, do those powers stack? Like, if you beat the game once, you get one power. You beat it again, you get another power? No, you get to pick from more. So if you beat it with a Infiltrator, basically that will pass down the ability to pick some tech power. And then the okay. next time you start the game, you can pick that tech power. But then when you beat the game with your next class, you add an additional ability. And it just keeps stacking. Where it's not that you have – you don't have more powers total, but you have more options. <clears throat> okay, now I understand. Gotcha. Yeah, that would be absurd if you could just be like yeah, – you just had all the powers. Yeah, at that point, you just don't have enough level points to accrue to, – to assign to them. But how did everyone find the combat? Like each of you – I think everyone used a smattering of the different abilities. So how did you find things? What did you find useful? What was not useful? I really like the ability to be able to pause. It, it lets you line up your shots. It let you, lets you throw powers in. It lets you think about the situation that you're in. So, I mean, every other shooter that I've played prior to this didn't have this pause mechanic. Um, I've played, a, like, Dragon Age before, but it's not really a shooter. Um, I, I really liked the ability to play a shooter and be able to pause and, you know, think and, you know, tactically figure out how I'm going to approach the situation. So just the act of pausing. And how did you find the different tech powers versus gun gun powers benefited from pausing. I really like to be able to throw like so many things out there. That that was pretty silly. Especially when you played Vanguard because you can use the adrenaline burst so you can just throw everything out there. Just throw your barrier up so you have more shields. <clears throat> throw, you know, uh, throw actually someone with an ability, just throw them and then lift them and then adrenaline burst and do it all again. Yeah, I need to unlock adrenaline burst. I will need that for when I do a speed run. Now that I know that that's a good ability. I never ever actually went down that tree because guns are dumb. It just so good. refreshes all cooldowns. Way good. Um, So my favorite part of the combat was that ev- like every gun was viable to use just kind of standalone. Like if you chose to be an expert at that gun, you, I guess this counts for all classes, except maybe soldier who was like all guns, every all, like all guns all day. But as infiltrator, I chose to just be really, really good with the pistol. And then I had my abilities, my tech abilities, which were basically revolved around these like little grenade type objects you could throw out and it deals AOE damage and those an effect on people. It would either be like a, like a maim where like it would overheat the weapons and they, then they couldn't attack you or it would disable their biotic or tech abilities, basically like a silence. And I feel like I had an answer for everything in my toolbox. And then also I chose to be proficient with pistol and max out my pistol abilities. And even though that's quote unquote the weakest weapon, it just, I, I never had a problem killing things with pistol with support from my abilities and my teammates. Everything was viable. Yeah, I mean, I think probably I'm the only person who went straight soldier, I guess, sort of the whole way through, at least for this playthrough. And, you know, while I do get a certain satisfaction from sniping people, and that's the reason I did it, I think sort of where this discussion's headed indicates that you do lose a little something, or a lot of something, when you don't necessarily pursue those adept or engineering powers. Yeah, so as someone who's played through this game multiple times, uh, I found biotics... So, strictly in a utilitarian sense, biotics are the strongest thing you can do in Mass Effect. I think you're right. Each of the So, each of the tech powers are suited to a specific enemy type. You've got AI hacking that just levels AI opponents like the Geth. You've got Overload, which also really hurts tech enemies and enemies with high shields. You have Sabotage, which shuts down enemy guns. You have dampening that shuts down biotic powers. But each of those is useful against one particular enemy type in one particular situation. If you're not against that enemy type, they just do damage. They do a relatively high amount of damage, I guess, for a tech for a power. It's 
it's also it's AOE. The AOE is it's useful, AOE. but in this game, there aren't people clumped up all the time. Usually, you're taking out one person behind one piece of cover, and the AOE is not big enough to hit multiple dudes. Um, or kill them, I should say. It, it might hit them, but it definitely won't down them. So like, biotic powers. There's only one or two AOE biotic powers. There's singularity and, like, and maybe... Lift. And lift yeah, and lift. They, they will both hit things in an AOE. But... Yeah, lift and throw have a very small AOE compared to the um, singularity. Tech singularity powers. is just absurd. Kind of but broken. The thing about biotic powers is they hit anyone regardless of situation, except for maybe drones, like flying drones, which you barely ever see. But when you hit someone with a biotic power, it hits them real hard. It hurts real bad. The thing it's good at is killing dudes. <laughs> Not being clever. It also, it also basically just it gives a free stun. Like yeah. the the really cool aspect of the tech power is that they give stuns, but then every biotic power just like unbalances an enemy. They're either like flying in the air or they fall down or they're like all drawn to the spot. So they just get like even though it doesn't say stun, it, they all stun every single one of them. Exactly. That's the big thing. When you hit someone with a sabotage, when you hit someone with a dampening, what you're trying to do is make it so they can't shoot at you anymore or hurt you anymore. Just by throwing them, they are down for even longer than a sabotage would would take them out, which means that really you have four or five sabotages or four or five dampenings, which is absurd. Um, and also, they're almost all one-hit kills later on in the game. Because throw, you just knock people into a, If you hit them into a wall, they're usually dead. Uh, if you hit them off a cliff, they're just dead. If you do a lift and you have a high-level lift power, it will take them so high into the sky, they just die. You just get experience points and money because they fly there, away into space. There was a couple times I was watching Devin's playthrough where he would, like, lift up a Krogan and it touched the ceiling and it just, like, clipped out of bounds and it, it was just gone. Yeah, there was a there was a Krogan that got thrown. It was um I think it was on Pharos. Pharos, yeah, it was on Pharos, and he like the little pathways. He like fell under the rail and somehow got caught in some kind of like area underneath the floor. <clears throat> so you could see him like he like his tar like he was totally targetable on the like when you pause the game, but just nothing could interact with him. And. That and... Was... Your allies oh, yeah, were just like shooting yeah. at the floor just over and over <laughs> the again. The allies wanted to kill that Krogan really badly. <laughs> yeah. And Singularity, speaking of a situation like that, at one point I had a glitch in Pharos where you have to deal with all the colonists and you have to deal with a bunch of colonists and you can kill people, you can save people. It's, it's a cool moment. But one person glitched through a wall. And they were on the other side of this wall, and there was no way to open the door that would let me interact with that to shoot this person. And so there's this person. I can't, inter I can't finish the mission because they're clipped out of the level. But because Singularity has such a huge area of effect and does so much damage, I just put Singularity on the, on the wall. And its AoE was so big that it caused the person on the other side of the wall to get picked up and slammed into the wall enough times to kill them. <laughs> That's how powerful biotics are. You don't even need to see the enemy. They just die. It's amazing. <laughs> like, when you use Singularity later on in the game, you will easily kill three three enemies in one hit. <clears throat> and if you don't kill them, you just disable them for so long, they might as well be dead. One thing I saw while watching Billy's playthrough that I found really impressive was Billy was an infiltrator, so he was tech. And then he played with Garrus, who also has tech moves. And then his third was often Liara. So he would singularity and then just throw like four tech explosions at everyone all clumped together. It was really dumb. Yes, and and that's what's cool is when you can party up with your your different team members and get some additional effects. You get a lot more of that in Mass Effect Two than in Mass Effect One. But I think if you are just trying to be expeditious in playing this game, biotics are what you want. Though I played Infiltrator first. It's super fun. Each of the guns actually we we breezed over the guns a little bit, but each of the guns has their own special ability associated with that gun, and they are all unique enough that I think it lends a different feel to each of those guns, outside of just the way they shoot. Like a shotgun, you have a, I think it's like overload, and you just Carnage. A, carnage, that's it. You shoot a big blast, and it's basically an extra grenade that does a ton of damage, 
Uh, for pistols, it's marksmanship, which for a, like, 10, 15-second window, your pistol does extra damage, it's extra accurate, and it almost never overheats. True. I think the assault rifle is overkill. I think it's similar to marksmanship, yeah. but for an assault rifle. And then sniper rifle, it's assassinate. It's called assassinate. Yeah. Badass power. It just gives it like a 100% or 200% damage bonus. I think at highest level it's 225% damage bonus. Is that right? That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah, it's absurd. It's way good. You one hit everything when you have that. So anyway, we've basically covered all the classes and a lot of the combat, but we hit on another topic that I want to talk about. If we're going to talk about mechanics, which is this game is buggy as shit. Yes. Yes. So I um I want to talk about I guess two things while I introduce the bugginess. There were times where this game you, you know you'd just be running through a level and the level would just fail to load so your game would crash. There were times where you'd be running through a level and you just fall through the floor and you would be f- just falling through space and death the floor. Um well I was turtles <laughs> turtles all the way down. I was actually driving in the little Land Rover on a planet and I clipped through the planet, and then I fell, and then I saw a picture of the universe. It was like a, it was, it wasn't just like an image file. It was, you know, it was the actual like, universe. Yeah, it, it was the actual universe. I kept tumbling, and then I saw myself playing Mass Effect. I, you know, and then, so that caused a lot of game crashes. And here's what I wanted to sort of like segue into, which was the way you can save or choose to save versus auto save in this game. So I, I, like every time I start a new game, I turn on – or like I go into the start menu, look at all the options, all the settings. Like I always turn on subtitles because I like to have subtitles on the screen so I can make sure I hear what everyone's saying. Um, I like to make sure that my X and Y axes are the proper orientation. Um, and one thing that I also do is say, hey, like is there an autosave feature? Do I want it on or do I want it not on? And in a game like this where you can make decisions that affect the story, I wanted to have autosave off and control all of my own save, save states. Well, that's fine because I'm good at saving, but not when I should be worried about just unexpected game crashes that set me back like an hour or so at, at, a, at a time sometimes. you know. And that was just terrible. Like it almost ruined the game experience. Then I turned autosave on, and it wasn't much better because the autosaving only occurred on like very critical points in the game. Like if you went to a new planet or a new system or if like a major event occurred. So you really weren't that safe. The only thing that was nice about it was that autosaving allowed me to have saves and autosaves. Yes, autosaves. So the only time the game autosaves is after huge events or some dialogue moments and then like the point of no return. So if you condition yourself to rely on that, I've lost probably... 10 hours, I would guess, total on the amount of time I've played Mass Effect to, to autosave problems. Wait, like just moments, this playthrough or, like, all together? No, oh, all together, whole, over, yeah. over all of my playthroughs. Yeah, okay. No, like, Novaria, which is a, a level with really bad autosave problems. It saves yeah, once it at the beginning of, like, this huge seg- sequence, and the next time there's a load is, like, Before the final boss, later. basically, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really bad, and so... If you play Mass Effect, save often. Just save often. I, How many saves did you have, Devin? I think I ended the game with ninety nine. You I think I had sixty or seventy. Bit. I I really should just like I should have realized that I was going to talk about this and just save one more time just so I could say a hundred. Yeah, right. That's really a mistake on my part. Wait, did you have an auto save? Yeah, I mean, I also had the auto save. There's one hundred. <laughs> Basically, did. yeah. Yeah. So I. I sped I because I'm preparing for the Giant Bomb Community Endurance Run. I'm planning on speed running at least Mass Effect One. If I can get some practice in on two and three, I might do those two, but we'll see. Um, because I was planning on speed running this, I was going through the game pretty briskly, and loads just conked out twice. Oh yeah, in the Citadel, multiple times. I was just well. I went onto the screen, and now Shepard's frozen. I, I never had the load, uh, like, conk out thing, but what I did have was probably the most like, aggressively problematic glitch that, that I experienced that Billy saw. Um, when I beat the game, like, defeated the final boss, there's this loading screen right before the game, like, considers the game actually beaten and lets you import it on to Mass Effect 2. 
and it would just stall out in the loading screen. You've probably seen the loading screen if you're listening to this podcast. It's like one of those old Mass Effect relay things that spin. It just stops spinning, and it, it, it would never fix it. So what I actually had to do to make, you know, actually be able to beat the game is I had to ref- like not ever pause during the final battle, which was kind of absurd considering that I was like an all all powers lineup. I guess we should explain a little more what we mean when we, what we mean when we say pause. Like you can like push like a uh, a trigger button. It's not actually pausing the game. It just like freezes time, so you can go into a menu and choose to cast your abilities on enemies. When, that, when, when we say pause the game, that's what we're actually meaning. And Devin had to just not do any of that yeah, tactical, for the final boss. The tactical pauses are an essential gameplay component in Mass Effect, so not doing that is annoying. Also, that's the way you pick what gun you want if you have more than one gun that matters. So it's that's really limiting yourself. Also, your AI companions are stupid as heck. And so if you're not telling them exactly what to do, they're just going to blow all... They're either going to blow all of their powers or not use them ever. With no in-between. Well, you, yeah, the, the settings are kind of lame in that you can use, like, never use powers, only use defensive powers, and then, like, throw all your powers out at the earliest opportunity. Yeah, so... You're basically playing with only your powers being relevant if you're playing without the ability to tactically pause and tell your your fellow characters what to do. I So I had a grenade. I tried to throw a grenade at the floor, and it went through the floor. And blew I, up the universe? Um, just Billy's universe. Oh, that's fine. Then we don't care about him. Just my universe. It's all, it's all good, guys. Then one time I was looking at the galactic map on the Normandy, and... I, like, turned to get away from the map, and I fell into the little alcove underneath the galactic map, and I was trapped behind the computers, and I luckily was able to escape because I talked to Exo Presley, and that warped me to the other side. So I was able to escape, thank goodness. Multiple times on Pharos, I got trapped in the floor? The same floor... In, like, multiple playthroughs. I've had this happen to me, like, four or five times. I've gotten caught in the same seam. It's amazing. This game is buggy as... I've never seen a game so buggy, be so critically beloved, and deserve <laughs> and deserve that that love so much. It's a fantastic game that was just made out of paper. <laughs> and <laughs> It was made out of paper like, mache and dreams. Yeah, basically. And ambitions. Lots of ambitions. So Did there's a lot of mechan- anything catastrophic happen. Nothing. Honestly, it it seems like I got away pretty lightly. Maybe because he was like, ah, whatever. He's just shooting guns. Let's leave him alone. <laughs> yeah, but it didn't like, yeah, calculate you, physics on you. As I was saying, if you ignore half the game, like you have less chance to be buggy, I guess. But I did have the save problems. Were like a few of the ones that sort of the problems I did hit were. I had a couple drop saves. And then maybe like one or two loading issues. But overall, I think I came out pretty light. Yeah, if it hadn't been for that final uh, problem I had with actually getting to be able to import my character, I would have said the same thing as Pete. Because I really didn't have anywhere near the number of problems that you and uh, uh, Billy and Gino had. Yeah, I mean... We just wanted to have fun. I have an old Xbox, like an original, almost an original Xbox 360. And so it chugs to begin with. And this game was always buggy, so it's it's just the worst of all worlds. <laughs> all right, so should we talk about the inventory system, Billy? Yeah. What things to say about that? All right, so rant incoming. Right, Stop me if you yourself. have any questions. Let me strap in. So I think this inventory system was pretty garbage. Um, let me try to think how I'm going to like approach this. So the Im- so here are the good things about the inventory system. One, it, it, it did the comparison from one item to the next flawlessly. So I always knew what my optimum equipment was. Only problem with that particular thing was it would also show you what you couldn't equip. So that sometimes was a little bit annoying that it would show you things that your character class was not allowed to equip in that comparison charge. Oh, oh, I have this great piece of armor. Oh, no, wait, that's a heavy armor. And I can't actually use heavy armor. Um, so 
that was the one little hitch. But other than that, the way it, it showed you comparing two items so that you know which ones to equip, that was that was pretty fine. Other things that bugged me were that if you're in a merchant, if you're like a merchant trying to buy or sell items, especially selling, it would sort the items based on what the game considered greatest mon- or like least monetary value to greatest monetary value. And that led for there being like a very convoluted sort of the items. So sometimes you'd say, I don't know if I have another version of this item that's better later. I have to scroll down and it's really hard to scroll because it's not very fast scrolling. It's kind of chunky. And you have to you know hope that the items that you have at the bottom of your list are better than the items at the top of your list because it's hard to navigate between that particular list. Next point about the inventory system is when ne- whenever you're on your ship between missions, you don't have your party members with you. So you can't actually look at their items. You have to like walk to a part of your spaceship and like look in their like loadout locker. And that's totally separate from where you go select your missions. It's also on the opposite side of where you could buy new items for them. So it's impossible to see and compare and buy new items for your crew members if you're not like in a level with your crew members with you. And then you still can't buy new items for your other crew members that aren't on that mission with you. So it just, it made it really, really hard to buy new items, to sell your items. There was no way you could sort them yourself by, you know, any sort of rhyme or reason. It was just whatever the game defaulted the sort for you was what it was. And I just, I didn't like it at all. I think this inventory system could have been done so much better and it wouldn't have even been that hard to do. Just give us one, a, a one button command to change how it's sorted. I'm going to say one I don't like commenting on how difficult or not difficult stuff is to actually implement without knowing how they would have had to implement it. True. But to- they did it for like the missions in your in your journal, you could sort by when it was given to you. You can sort by um n- the the newest, you could sort by priority, you could sort by whatever, you could sort alphabetically. And now you could do that for your for your journal entries. You couldn't do it for your items, even if it was just alphabetical. I'm just saying, without knowing how they arrange things on the back end, I don't, I don't like making the assumptions, even though it might seem obvious. All right, fair point. Be a technical reason. I don't know. Fair point. Yes, it is a fair criticism that it should be better. Uh, It definitely the sorting is bad. Two, you can always turn everything into omni gel, which I mean is the best option possible. Of course, perfect. Omnigel for the Omnigel god. What was Omnigel? Omnigel is this useful... Gel does everything. It, it does whatever you want. Whatever you need, baby. <laughs> it can be whatever you want it to be. Can, do you need to... real explanation. Do you need to repair your Mako? Omnigel's got you covered. Do you need to mm-hmm. hack some locks? Omnigel. Omnigel's got you. You hungry? Uh- is Omni Gel even used for the melee attacks? No. Or is that a different kind of gel? You just punch dudes with the melee attacks. Oh, there's Medi Gel. Medi Gel. Okay. Not to be confused with Omni Gel. No. Medi Omni Gel is for very inanimate different. objects. Medi Gel is used for peoples. Okay. I so, think. one thing that was good about that was that there there came a time in the game where money stopped mattering, and selling items was just completely useless. It didn't matter that you could sell an item because you had too much money. You you could just buy whatever you wanted. So money stopped mattering. They made item pickups that you would find in game relevant because you turn you could turn every item into into the substance omni gel. You would get four units of omni gel per item. I just no matter, love that no matter no how matter, good the item was. No matter what how big the item is, no matter what it represents, it's always four units of omni gel. It could have been a pistol <laughs> Four units of Omni Gel, like late full game body. armor, full body armor. Four uh, units of bo- four units of Omni Gel. Those think, bullets, four units of Omni Gel. Do you the think reason, Omnigel yeah, is like like the gold of the future. Like if you're worried about inflation, you put your currency in gold. <laughs> you put it in Omni Gel in the I'm future. Not sure, it's very I mean, stable. Omni Gel so static. Yeah, it's very stable. It is the bonds of the future. Here's why Omni Gel was actually good, because they're. Like I said, there was a tower where money stopped mattering, and Omni Gel was used to just say, "I don't want to actually play this hacking mini game for the three hundredth time this in this playthrough. I'll just Omni Gel to instantly open it. it." It's like in other games that are like this, 
Um, I think I, mean, I know um, I know Fallout had it, but Fallout had like automatic lockpick tools. You had like a an inventory of like auto lockpick tools, and if you ever had a hard lock, you would just auto break the lock using one of these consumable items, and it worked effectively the same. It just said in the late game, you don't have to deal with that bullshit anymore, which is pretty can we, nice. Can we discuss the hacking mini games really briefly? Yeah, oh, yeah. It's Simon. There's Simon. Basically, you can play Simon Says. There's Frogger. For the most part. Which one's Frogger? You had to like, there'd be like concentric rings that you'd have to like step through. I'm not making that up. I'm like, that's a thing. It, that's only on the PC version. So how did you, I thought. I'm, I'm making that up. Whatever. Yeah. It exists. Yeah. It's mostly thing. Simon. It's not. Yeah. It's not good. It, well, it's as good as Simon is, I guess. <laughs> so depending on how you feel about Simon. Just like in Bioshock, depending on how you feel about pipe dreams, mm. that your mileage may vary. I but. really did like. Um, I, we, we shouldn't discuss which mission because spoilers. But there was a there was a mission where you had like a different mini game where you had to. Um, I guess like, I guess I don't, I don't really know what to compare it to. Do y'all know what to compare oh, that mini yeah. game to? What is that stacking game? It's where you have like three cylinders and you pull the rings off of one and then restack uh, them. Yeah. I, I found others. that minigame so much more fun than any of the mini games that we saw throughout the rest of the game. I wish we had had something more along those lines. Because the game, like most of the way I play Mass Effect is like a methodical, like tactical like thing where I'm really like thinking through my actions. And there's this hacking minigame where my reflexes just need to be like on point. And I need to like react immediately or I just instantly fail. So that's how hackers like a, are. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly how hacking is in the real world. If Swordfish taught me anything. That's the one thing that Swordfish taught you? That's well, the Swordfish thing? taught me other things, but this is a family podcast, you know. Okay, got it. So, yeah, the hacking's kind of terrible, but hey, I like the idea of just uh, this amorphous gel <laughs> that can just be rubbed across anything, and it just makes stuff work. <laughs> It makes me sad that it's not in any of the other games. You have Mako problems? Like, your axle broke? Just squirt some Omnigel on it. <laughs> you need to fix Mako this computer? Wait, you need to fix this computer? Just just pour some Omnigel on top. Pick a lock? Just attempt? put Omnigel in it. Is there ever an attempt to explain the mechanics behind Omnigel, or would they just, like, give up on that one? Like, there's Oh, no, no, man. There's got to be a codex entry. They make, right? There is a codex entry. It doesn't explain a lot, and then they make a joke about it in... Two or three. One of they. Whenever something doesn't make sense, they just kind of make an offhand joke about it and then move on with their lives. Okay. Speaking of Mako problems, the Mako exists and it's a problem. Did you guys find the Mako to be a terrible, b inoffensive, c bad? It's it's for people who thought. <laughs> The warthog in Halo is just like a little too well thought out. <laughs> it's like, it's got a little too much weight. Too. I'm gonna go so... with B inoffensive. Um, I I think it was fine. I think I accomplished everything it needed to do. Um, I, I think I think Billy wanted to talk about the planetary exploration aspect of it. No, you. I, I think you should finish talking about just like what what Mako did. So, Why did we even need a Mako? What is this thing? So the Mako is, we get to land on plants mostly for side quests, I think. I, I, I think we had a couple um, non-side quest uses of it. There was mostly used just for the combat element, where you had um, a, a like kind of crappy machine gun, and then you just had like a really way much, way more powerful, um, just like explosion, basically like point Cannon. explosion. Yeah, I don't really know what it was. It, it was it, like, like instant a cast. Yeah, it was like click, boom. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so the combat element was present, and you could also hit X to like jump because tanks need to jump. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> Omni gel, Omni gel, did it. Omni gel. That's probably how the thrusters work. Uh, <laughs> I just love that if if you time it right, and you're fighting like a Geth Colossus or something that shoots rockets that you can clearly see coming, you don't you ever need to dodge. You just them. jump over them. <laughs> you can jump over rocks. It's yes. really I'm surprised you weren't doing that, Pete, because you can just hop right over a missile. <laughs> that's awesome. So but, I never um, move. I get in one position, and then it's just hopping. Every that's also seconds. how I that's use That's the, the right way to play. 
But um, the the other element of it outside of the combat, where you mostly do in the main story missions, um, the the side quests, you like land on a planet, and you can look at your map and see where the like useful things on the planet are, and you basically just drive around on the planet. You can drive on the on you know v- various different planets. Some have elemental hazards um, that are, like, kind of mess with you a little bit, but um. Th- the Mako, what it really accomplishes is it lets you get a feel of, I am a space explorer exploring like things that no one else has messed with before. And it, it did accomplish that, even if it was at best inoffensive. Yes. My problem with the Mako is not with what they designed it, what role they expected it to accomplish. It is the way in which it accomplishes that. The Mako feels like it is about as hefty as a Hot Wheels toy wielded by a two-year-old. If you run it up, if you run it next to a wall, it goes immediately up that wall. It doesn't bump into it. It doesn't like slowly go up it. It just goes immediately zero zero to a hundred, real, real quick. quick, real quick. If you go up like a slanty sort of like ramp where half of the Mako is up the ramp, half of it is off, it will bounce and like fly. If you go up a ramp, it will sometimes just like do a flip. If you bump it's into a car, it's because a two-year-old's driving, and they think flips are sweet. And it also, sucks. it's in magic physics land where your tank can rotate about eight times in two seconds, and no one's spine is separated from their body. It's just you. It's full of Omni Joe. It holds <laughs> <me>. Wait, just <laughs> don't worry, guys. It's all about the Mass Effect. The Mass Effect. Sometimes it. I, like, bumped into a little car in front of me, and I thought that I would go over, the, you know, I would just Do a back go flip. over it and keep going. But no, it's like backflip. The thing's completely disoriented. <laughs> you don't lose any momentum, so you just all of a sudden are going in the wrong direction. I almost died in the Mako so many times from just, like, hitting a weird lip that I did not see coming, and then just your momentum carries you, and you can't back up. At you one time... Um, I actually drove the Mako, like, by the lava, and I guess just my hitbox of, like, my tire just, like, barely ran over the lava, and just, like, instantly game over. <laughs> Your tire touched the lava dead. <laughs> that is that is a Mako experience. Omni Joe was not able to fix the lava burns. <laughs> there was one time when I was going up the... So the Mako, if you are not at about 90 degrees, if you are at 89 degrees, the Mako can go. It'll go up. It will not go 90 slowly. degrees. No, no, It'll go no. slowly. Like 89 degrees. Like if you're just <sighs> just a not little it. bit, you can keep going up. So there were a lot of times when I just was exploring a planet and I didn't know the correct way that the game wanted me to go. So I was like, well, I see an icon. I guess I'll just go <clears> up <throat> this sheer cliff. And then it turns out if you hit the jump jets, uh, it doesn't go up. It pushes you away from whatever surface you are on. So if you're at, like, 89 degrees and then you press jump jets, it hurls you off of the the cliff, and you have to start all over again. But on the upside, the Mako is wildly overpowered. So when you are fighting against actual regular enemies, since the Mako has static damage for the entire game, it always deals way too much damage. It lets you kill enemies that give you a ton of experience with just trivially. Like, if you hit them with the Mako, they die. Uh, the, oh, my fa- my favorite thing was when you were fighting the Geth Colossi. I think there was an ar- armature. Is that the two giant tank? Yeah, Colossi, oh. Colossus, and armature. You can it doesn't kill them or do any damage. You can just like run them over and they'll like fall to the ground and like not be able to shoot while they're you know like getting up. I thought that was just really funny. It was oh, not so, yeah, it was not the most effective way to deal with those enemies. It was just a very amusing. Thing I actually use that a lot because if I ever ran out of shields and like had to like had to um figure out some way to deal with enemies i would just run them over and it di- it didn't do much damage to them but what it would do is just like stun them for like six seconds and i could just keep backing over the same guy and so he was just like disabled <laughs> for <laughs> while i while i just picked off his buddy and i just keep like backing up going forward backing up over him. it did basically no damage but he wasn't able to shoot at me so i was fine me very much. Yeah. I had fun playing the game. And that's the point, really. I mean, that's why we're all here. So that's yes. the Mako. 
So speaking of being thrown ragdoll and just being Great unable segment. to get up. Keep it up. How did how did you guys feel about enemies having biotic powers? Any of the enemies that had biotics. It was fine. They usually weren't that good. They usually had just like a dumbed down version of yours. And it was like there was more of them and one of you or one or two of you. So my biotic or my attack powers are just way better. They also had them, but they were sort of in bulk. But not that good. I found it to be the most frustrating thing in in the entire game when you get hit with a throw or you get hit with a f- stasis or something. Now because... you know how those geth feel. Yeah, a little empathy for the geth, Gina. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. But in a game with a tactical pause and when your AI companions are stupid, very, very stupid. Hang on a second. They were fine. No. Have you no. were playing the game wrong, then. No. I, <laughs> I, I had... made them real smart. I, when I told them what they do, they were brilliant. Oh, yeah, mine, were, you... mine were so good. Here's the problem. When you are hit by a, a biotic push or a stasis, you can no longer give commands. That makes so... sense, though, because you got laid the fuck no, I, out. I, I, so if I you're don't... Commander Shepard, you can't be like, hey, go stand over there because you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're flying. I <laughs> don't care that it makes sense. I don't care, because you know what? There were times when I had an enemy down to one hit, literally one hit. All they needed to do was shoot that thing once. And they instead decided to shoot at the floor while I was, like, in the fetal position on the ground, just floating That's a weird space. A fetal position, Gina. I was just, <laughs> I was like, yeah, ah. I, I never really had much of a trouble with the biotic enemies, and I'm really surprised that you did, you know, as a vanguard, because, like, the way that you fight as a vanguard, it's, like, very high risk, high reward. I kind of just, like, get up in people's faces a lot. So I felt like most of the biotic enemies were pretty squishy, and if I got up in their face, that they went down pretty hard. Yeah, so since I was speedrunning, being squishy, since I was sort of squishy, if I yeah. did not kill the biotic enemy with extreme prejudice immediately and got hit with a push... I'm running all the time, so I'm not worrying about healing myself. I'm under-leveled for most of the game. I just need to make sure that my powers hit and I, I kill them because my allies won't. And the problem with biotic powers is when I get hit with them, all of a sudden it is incumbent upon the AI to realize, hey, this thor- this weird like zombie creature is not as threatening as the person with the gun shooting Commander Shepard. And they never figured it out. I was on the ground for about 10 seconds, and the entire time, all either of them had to do was shoot the person standing directly next to them. But instead, they decided that a zombie across the in, on the other side of the level was far more threatening, and I had a game over. And that happened to me multiple times, just that from sucks. getting hit um, by a biotic push and then being unable to tell my AI companions, hey, shoot the guy who's shooting me. There's actually a workaround for that. There's actually a way you can make that not happen anymore. It's called do better. Oh, that's a great, uh, that's great feedback. I will get take that. Good. I will take that into consideration going forward. All right, thank you. That's good. I, I so, you know, I'm just looking out for you, man. Yeah, that's we're good. just trying I, to help I you need out. that. I need that feedback. So just do better. The last yes. mechanical thing I think that's worth mentioning is the Paragon Renegade system. Yep. yep. This is important for the story, but it's also a very, very mechanical system. So in Mass Effect, there are two, count them, two moralities. There's Paragon, which is space goody two-shoes, and there's Renegade, which is space asshole. Either of these are valid. They are both valid ways to play the game. You will, if you are a Paragon, you are the Paragon of all the universe everyone loves you if you're a renegade for some reason you you're a dick to everyone done. what'd you say said you get the job done yes any means necessary despite punching dudes in the face who don't need to be punched shooting people who don't need to be shot <laughs> whatever you say no, no, no anyway. that guy's a little crazy like he's kind of saying some weird stuff he's gotta die he's That's gotta it. die kill him it's the only only solution no time for talking to this crazy person instead punch or trigger pull. Or trigger pull. Or so, force push. Or force push. Or reporter, I've had enough with your disingenuous accusations. <laughs> Whack. Pistol so, whip. That is the morality system for the most part. And 
you get Paragon points, usually by pit holding up to the right on the dialogue wheel, and you House get Renegade. Alone. You get Renegade points for holding down to the right in your dialogue wheel, and occasionally you have moments where you can get big boosts of Paragon or Renegade based on your actual actions instead of just which dialogue choices you're picking. But what did you guys feel about this morality system? So I'll say this, and we'll we'll probably have a caveat about it in a moment, but I'll just start. So one thing I did like about it is that there's not sort of a, uh, a canceling out. Like in a lot of games' morality systems, you can cancel out one good action with one bad action, and you sort of bait or vice versa, and you're sort of back to where you started. Whereas in Mass Effect, it, it does sort of count regardless of what you do. Yes. And Devin, Billy? Um, yeah, you, you, sh- you should go first, Devin, if you're, if you're um, ready to talk. So what I would say is I, I do like the existence of Paragon and Renegade. I, I think it's good. I'm glad that it's in the game. And I understand why this doesn't exist. Uh, so, so basically, the fact that they have Paragon and Renegade means that they basically need to have, for every story event, they have to write two scripts. You know, they have to write two separate stories, pretty much. Um, obviously, you know, the, they're pretty similar stories. But the, the truth of the matter is that, like, both the Paragon and the Renegade, ad, as as Gino was referring by saying Space Goody Two Shoes and Space Asshole, I mean, they, they were pretty shallow. They were not, like, dynamic yeah. characters. They didn't feel very real. And I think if there was some kind of, um, it, if we kind of had like two different axes to work with, like if we had a lawful versus chaotic and a good versus evil, and if we had both of those two, I really think we could get a lot more dimension to our characters. I understand that the amount of writing that probably be necessary to put something like that in the game is probably you know, immense, and that's probably why it's never really been done and worked with as far as I know. Um, but I, I really wish there was some way to make our characters feel a little more like they were ours and the way we could really like step into the game instead of just being like, I'm a good guy or I'm a bad guy. And I have to support Devin and take it a little bit different way. I have to choose options or, or choose things that I think, well, I guess I'll rephrase it in this way. Um, I could see myself relating to my, my, commander shepherd and i i did in many ways like i i played the game so that i related to the character that i was playing otherwise you get this weird disconnect in the narrative that oh you said well that's nothing like me i'm now disconnected from the story i would use my force powers this way i would use my force powers this other way yeah basically what pete just said and um I, i found that really the only option for me for me was i was not going to be space asshole if they gave me four options, like Devin was suggesting, like like lawful good versus chaotic good, or you know, lawful evil, not lawful evil, but like you could be lawful evil. Yeah, yeah, you you can you can you you you, you can play by the rules and be a dick about it, <laughs> and then you could be like chaotic or whatever. If I had that option, I would just know that I wasn't going to be like the most asshole version, then maybe I'd have, you know, two or three ways to choose. In this scenario, in Mass Effect, I really only had one choice. I didn't really choose to be space goody two-shoes. I just knew that space asshole would have disconnected me from the game. So I couldn't choose anything else. It's worth mentioning, if you're not one of those two things, you are actively getting penalized by the game. True. You have to commit all the way. Like, you are 100% or negative 100%. Like, those are the two options, or you get major game consequences. And there's so the there are... to my point that like it doesn't necessarily cancel out, but you have no incentive to not go the whole way one or the other. Yes. So there's two tech trees basically in your character's character sheet. There's Paragon and there's Renegade. And if you are Paragon or it's it's rephrased, I think, like persuasion and intimidation or something. Yeah. But as you get Paragon points or charm and intimidation what? yeah it's charm it's and charm intimidate. and intimidate Something like that. so as you get paragon points you unlock the ability to put more points into charm as you get more renegade points you get the ability to put more points into intimidate and without putting points into charm and intimidate there are dialogue options you will never have and that just means that at major junctions of the game if you need to convince someone to do something instead of forcing them, usually the option is like fight this person or convince them not to fight you. You just can't convince them because you're not 
Paragon or Renegade enough. And always, you can solve that situation either way. You can be a jerk and convince them, or you can be charming and convince them, which is really weird. That... I wouldn't say it's charming as much as it is like charisma. It's like you use your charisma to show them a different path. I found that even though it said, quote-unquote, charm, I found my Commander Shepard like, appealing to the other person's like Dignity true motives. Those. Yeah. Yeah. Like saying, wait, your true motives are doing this instead. How about you achieve this goal some other way instead of trying to fight me right now? You know, or like, you don't need to, you don't need to do this. I'm like, yeah, I do. And then like, no, wait, there's another option. And then they'd say, you might have a point there. So I never felt like I was charm using. And I guess I'm more defensive about this because I played female shepherd. And so it, it definitely wasn't like feminine wiles that I was using, right? Yes. That, I wasn't that like, was not. I wasn't turning on the charm. It wasn't charm in, like, the sense that a lot of JRPGs are different. Like, the charm status effect where they won't attack you or something. Right. Gino, um, do do you know, because I I really only played this game Paragon. As as you said, is it, like, I know it's avoiding fight, but is it, like, usually substantially different um, from, like, a flavor or, like, thematic perspective? Yeah, like, in big moments where you have to use charm or intimidate... If you're Paragon, you're like, hey, there's a better way to do this. Don't do this. You you just lost your way. What if we didn't fight? With Intimidate, it's like, you're, you're shit. You don't even deserve the hope that I'm giving you. But I'm giving you this choice. And so you're basically either in – you're belittling or berating someone into picking but, but the what, result, doing like, what you want. The result is the same. Oh, so the result is the same every time. Because I know in 2, because yes. I recently played some 2, um, like, th- there was a situation where you could, like, deal with, like, a relationship. And you could basically convince them to keep the relationship or break up. And those were the Paragon and Renegade options. But there's nothing like that in this game. It's, like, whatever you want them to do, you just convince them to do it. It's not, like, you can intimidate them to do this beneficial option to you do. Or you can Paragon them to do this other beneficial option to you. It's the same option both times. Yes, it's just, do you have the skill check, yes or no? If you don't have the skill check, sorry, you probably have to fight them or you have to do something you didn't want to do. If you have the skill check, regardless of which one you you meet, you meet it just unlocks that option. It unlocks the nonviolent option. Now, let's just hang tight for a second and say that there are some times where your Paragon or Renegade or your, your Charm or your Intimidate actually make huge shifts in the story. There's like one or two moments where... This, it, it actually matters which one, which one you've chosen, and it will appear in your subsequent, not subsequent places, but it'll like carry over into your next Mass Effect game. But it's There's also couple... worth mentioning, when those moments happen, it doesn't matter which choices you've been making for the entire rest of the game. You Basically. don't unlock, in Mass Effect 1 specifically, you do not unlock additional choices at the end of the game like hey it's really inconsistent for your person who's been paragon this entire time to go renegade on this one it's no one would do this it doesn't make sense you can always just say fuck it i make this choice anyway so anytime when there's a big world changing choice for the most part if you are paragon or renegade you can pick whichever one on a moment to moment basis uh except Sometimes when it's, you know, you need those higher skill checks where you have to be super Paragon or super Renegade, then you'll only have the option that you've committed to. So that on the, in those rare cases, you will only have the super Paragon or super Renegade options. Also worth mentioning, when you have high Paragon and Renegade, using the high Paragon or high Renegade option gives you more points in that skill. So there's even bigger feedback loop where... Yeah, yeah you could really get into a... Yeah, you could really get into a spot, like, if you didn't realize early on enough that you just absolutely had to commit one way or the other, it's really easy to get to a point where you are, you didn't commit enough, and now it's really difficult to try to fix that, because you don't get those options that give you the most Paragon or most Renegade. Exactly. So, commit. Pick one or the other if you're playing this game. You have to commit. It's not like Fallout or something where, hey, I did all this good stuff, and I want to... I want to get negative karma, so I'm just going to steal until I have negative karma. Yeah. What helped with Fallout was that the the things that you did were so isolated in that game 
like the little stores are like little microcosms. And if you were a complete asshole to one community, you could just actually, you know, detonate the whole place. And everyone who thought you were an asshole doesn't exist anymore. And everyone else thinks you're just a, you know, a nice guy. <laughs> that was an option of Fallout. Not so much in Mass Effect. Exactly. So, so I think that's pretty much it for the mechanics. Yeah. Of Any other mechanics we can think of before we want to want to move on? I, I think all the other. Oh, go ahead, Pete. No, no I was gonna say I think that's that's the main points we hit. Oh, one thing that um I I didn't remember to mention when Gina was talking about how biotics affect everyone that includes like bosses. It, it's not like oh, true. the the tech and biotic powers just suddenly don't work. Like on a lot of games, your like special stat ability doesn't work on the boss. Like you can't use your finicky, you know, special abilities. But in this game, just the bosses are just as you know weak to tech and biotic attacks as the um, you know regular run of the mill enemies. Which means that the final boss is trivial. Yeah. Most of the enemies in this game are trivial because biotics are super overpowered. Yeah, unless you can't access your power wheel, and then you just gotta you gotta go hard with the pistol. <laughs> Yes, or if you're like in the fetal position, knocked down from biotic <laughs> powers, in which case you're just you're fucked because your allies won't shoot the thing they need to shoot. So that is going to do it for part one. Um, if you want to leave feedback, mention worth mentioning. We forgot to hit the feedback. We have some feedback. We'll get to it in part two. So if did for we example, lose Gino? You sent in feedback and what? Hello? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, yeah can. hear me back now. Can All you right, me? just okay. give the outro again. Yeah. So, everyone who is listening, uh, if you want to leave feedback, you can go ahead and leave feedback at Deep Listens Pod on Twitter, Deep Listens Podcast at Gmail dot com, or you can go to Deep dot dot com and leave comments on the podcast. We'll find it, uh, and we will read them on the show. We have some commentary that we forgot to get to at the beginning of this episode. It will be in the beginning of the part two of the Mass Effect, two podcast series, I suppose. Yeah. And we will we will get to that commentary post-haste. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Billy. I had to get out. Thank you, Pete. Oh, boy. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, anyone. <laughs>